Diplomacy, ladies and gentlemen, is not just the art of morality, it's also the art of the possible. So let us begin in the areas upon which we would agree. We would agree the situation in Syria is appalling. Tell you what, let's cut it short. I'm the, I'm the president of UNICEF UK. I know how awful it is very well indeed. So let's just play this little thought for you. You invent the adjective about how awful things are there, and I will agree with you. But that's not the question. The question is, what can we do more than we have done? Diplomacy is the art not just of morality, but the art of the possible. Let me agree also with Nigel and with Roger that the early part of the diplomacy of this was very badly handled. Instead of making our intervention about, about humanitarianism, we made it about regime change. A very stupid thing to do, inviting the Russians to participate in getting rid of the one person who is their friend in the Middle East. And we did what we've done before. Instead of building a wider consensus, we led a Western-led posse uh, to do things which were based on the impossible. Can we intervene? And the reason, Roger, that we did that was precisely because Downing Street and Western leaders believed, as Roger appears to believe, that this is a rerun of Bosnia. No, it isn't. I was with you, Roger. I saw Bosnia up close and personal. I was deeply involved in it. The failure to understand that the West is not in the same position as it was when we intervened in Bosnia and Kosovo, for reasons I will explain, and Syria is not the same as Bosnia and Kosovo, is the very reason which led us into those early mistakes. You see, there is a rule, it seems to me, that is accepted by most value systems, which goes something like this. If you should and you can, it is a sin not to. But if you should and you cannot, it is not. By the way, if you look at Thomas Aquinas and the Just War, you'll find that he assembles five basic principles when it is proper to have a just war, in this case intervene, and the principles apply to our present circumstances. One, there is an egregious breach of international law. Two, the effect of that spreads wider than the country concerned to affect the stability and peace of the wider region or indeed the world. Three, you have exhausted all diplomatic possibilities. Four, the means by which you wish to intervene is commensurate and proportionate with the sin that's being committed. Five, it is legal. And six, please note six. Thomas Aquinas said, that long, Aquinas said it that long ago. There has to be a reasonable prospect of success. And if you can believe there is, then you can go with these two. Note that Roger didn't propose anything. Long on morality, short on solutions. The only solution that I heard was that we should have safe havens. Remember them? And we should have aid corridors. Remember them? I do. He does too. You don't have them unless you can protect them. That is the lesson of Srebrenica. Surely you understand that, Roger. I mean, the truth about it is that if you were to invent this, if you were to bring this into effect, who is going to protect those? And if nobody protects them, you are replaying Srebrenica all over again. This is not the same as Bosnia and Kosovo. And let me see if I can explain the three reasons why it isn't. First of all, the geopolitical consequences of Syria are far wider, far more complex. This is not actually about Syria. Syria is the front line in a wider war. And that wider war is an attempt to radicalize the Sunni Ummah as a preparation to a wider regional Sunni-Shia conflict. That's actually what this is about. Syria is a front line in the same war you see being fought out in Lebanon, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Libya, in Mali. That's actually what you're intervening in. Do you want to get yourself engaged in that? And by the way, when Russia says no, she says no not just because Assad is the only friend they have left. She says no because she is suffering from exactly the same thing in the Islamic republics that run up to the Caucasus, the, the, the Dagestan and Chechnya. You are looking here at the possibility of a widening conflict which will engulf the whole of the Middle East. And there's a real possibility, ladies and gentlemen, that we will get instrumentalized on the side of the Sunni, and Russia gets herself instrumentalized on the side of Iran and Assad and the Shia. Is that what you want? That is the consequence. This never existed in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Never. 
And the second reason, and Rosemary's touched on it very clearly, is because we're not in the same position. Sorry, guys. Actually, when we come to think about foreign affairs today, we must realize the new position we're occupying in the world. We don't have armed forces that are capable of doing this any longer. We could not mount, just by the West alone, an intervention on the scale of Bosnia. It was difficult enough then, and even more so in Kosovo. Now it would be frankly impossible, as you see Western defense budgets reduced and diminished, unless we have friends, unless you build a wider coalition. And the third reason is, I'm sorry about this, Roger, but the West is no longer in the totally dominant ascendant position it was in, in Bosnia and Kosovo. When if the West acted together, it could propose and dispose in every corner of the world at will. It could ride roughshod, as it did in Kosovo, over a UN Security Council resolution. We no longer live in a monopolar world, we live in a multipolar world. A multipolar world we share with others. And what that means is that we have now, and you may think this is a good thing, perhaps I do too, to listen to the UN Security Council. We cannot act without the UN Security Council's agreement. Absent that, there is no legal basis for action, which is also practical. Absent Russia and China's agreement to that, we could not act. Was it the West's fault? We tried, we put those resolutions forward. No, it was Russia and China who blocked that. Who is responsible for the sclerosis of the UN that um, Nigel spoke about? Not the West. That's Russia and China. If you want to find someone to blame, do not blame the West in this. You may blame the East. We could do one thing. And I'm sad that our parliament chose not to. When Assad crossed this fatal line, the use of chemical weapons, when he broke the single greatest pillar of international law that's existed since 1920, an absolute prohibition on the use of weapons of mass destruction in the form of chemical or biological warfare, we decided that we would act and we were right to do so. We were not acting to intervene, we were acting to uphold international law. And it's a matter of the greatest sadness to me that my parliament failed to vote to do that. You know, you can be proud of parliament's ability to stand up to the executive and deeply ashamed of the position that it took. And that's how I felt the next day. And it was because the United States, and God help us, France as well, were serious about taking action to uphold international law, not to intervene, but to hold international, uphold international law, that finally Putin and Assad decided to move. And that has given us an opportunity now to have Western inspectors in, to have a real prospect of taking, for God's sake, the one thing we can take out of this terrible conflict, and the widening conflict too. Chemical weapons and weapons of, biological, of a biological nature. Now, is it necessarily the case that's going to succeed? No. But it's opened up a whole new dialogue. A new dialogue with Iran. The chances of moving to an agreement not just about Syria, but much wider than that. Is that certain? No, ladies and gentlemen. But it is possible. And diplomacy is the art of the possible. Anything else was simply an exercise in morality without being underpinned by the possibility of success. No more, no less. We haven't failed. We've done the best we can. Not, I have to say, the House of Commons, but the West. If you want to blame somebody, blame the East. <laughs>